I listened to that drinking history one. All oh, right. With uh, Raymond Mearns. Oh, that's Mearns. the best episode. Oh, that's class. That, yeah. uh, he's hysterical. Yeah, we, we <laughs> honestly, like, we sat drinking with him for, like, two or three hours after that. Yeah. He just told us a million stories, and we were just like, should we, do, should we just hit record? Yeah. <laughs> How's that looking, Lee? <clears throat> he was on that Some Laugh, whatever it's called. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was good on that. Yeah. Again, like, I feel like they probably had to edit so much out of that. So, yeah. Not because he'd say anything bad. He just tells, like, these big, long, amazing stories. Um, yeah. And he's just cool. that kind of guy, man. Like, yeah. The best part that we, we always wish that we'd re- recorded, though, is uh, Raheel that was on that episode. It, we were we were drinking afterwards and we were talking about this stuff and he just goes, like, just interrupts Raheel in the middle of a sentence. Thanks, just goes. <laughs> <laughs> the timing of that was so good. <laughs> oh no, it's my real voice. <laughs> um, it's a different level of sound more today. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's not the, the the end of the story does not live up to the to the, the epicness we've, we've created here um, you know he, he just interrupted him and we just went Raheel you need to shut the fuck up <laughs> like he did it like it was advice he was like yeah, yeah you need I've got you need to shut the fuck up he seems, <laughs> you need to stop talking he seems like the opposite like if you see him and hear his jokes you think or he's just one of these kind of like old kind of pub punters but he's funny and then when he talks he's actually really like oh he's intelligent so intelligent yeah. yeah yeah he's like um he told me something like he reads like 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 five books a week or something like that yeah. like something mad like he's so that sounds like finch out of the office <clears throat> yeah like he's just so like well read like he's really really smart and he just like has it's it's probably why like i saw him at the fringe like every every year, like he basically does a, a, a an extra day at the fringe, right. and it's just for comics to go, and um, we always go to it, and he just improvises like the majority of the show, and it's just because like someone will tell him something about them. Like there was a guy from Russia in the front row, and he just started doing all these facts about Russia. Like he just had like all these. Oh, I read this book, and there's this thing, and it's, but it, it was all hilarious as well. Like yeah. I think he said that he did about like twenty minutes of like actual stuff he'd written. And it was all just like funny things he knew. Like <laughs> just off the top of his head then. Yeah. He's just a genius. What, cool. What's the podcast called again? I guess we're recording already, yeah. Yeah. A nice cold start. What what drinking history or what's it? Yeah, uh, this month in drinking history. This month in drinking history. I liked and there was a part where you you'd made a joke and he was like, Yes, I love that. The vulnerability, that's honesty. <laughs> he's like giving you kind of like feedback on yeah. the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's a I don't know if it made it in. Because I think he he didn't really expect because he never heard of me. That's kind of my mm. brand. There's no one hearing of me. But like, I think he was surprised that I would hit him with like a pelter despite like not really knowing him. I don't know if it's in that episode, but there's a part where I mis- just made a joke about like having loads of ex wives, and it yeah. wasn't really specifically about him. But he he jokes himself about having like ex wives and that, and he's just like, oh, that was. <laughs> Like, I didn't expect that. Like, <laughs> hey, what was it? It was something to do with like alcohol is, and then it's some or a hangover is losing your wife or something or drinking to oblivion. I can't remember something. Yeah, I mean that when we like sometimes I don't do it because I don't really drink that much anyways. But, but sometimes when we do the podcast, like almost every other guest, like they'll just be drinking along. Sometimes I don't, but um, that one I got like really drunk after it because I was like. <laughs> it was my work Christmas night out mm-hmm. so I like did some of the cri- Christmas night out went and did the podcast and then I went back to the night out <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> so I was like absolutely steaming that night there was a, a funny episode to happen here then I was get a few cans and yeah, yeah. <laughs> just talk and see what yeah. happens painting a podcast yeah <laughs> um, yeah so the last episode we had Billy Kirkwood on mm-hmm. um, uh, he was absolutely hilarious great guy uh, I think you said you were driving up to Aberdeen with him? Yeah, we did week? like a couple of weeks ago. We we did the, the big three hours each way drive to, to right. Aberdeen. How's that being a, a passenger with Big Billy? It was great. Like, yeah, because like, well, I think we've got a lot of the same interests as well. Mm-hmm. So it was just like, I think we, d- we just talked about like wrestling and mm-hmm. um, he'd seen a lot of like horror films and stuff like that, which I'm not like that big into, but I love like films and that. So I was just like talking to him about those things. The wrestling thing's one of these that seems to have 
caught the attention or the imagination of everybody except for me, like in our like age bracket. <laughs> it's like, like went straight past me. Well, there's like the I think within like wrestling fandom is like there was the Brit wrestling boom of like I don't know. It was when I was still here, like so maybe like twenty sixteen or something like that, twenty fifteen. Like British wrestling like really, really took off. Right. To the point where like WWE made their own uh, like TV show. I mean, it was on their streaming service, but like they made their own. It was NXT UK, and they just signed all mm. these British wrestlers just because it was so big here, uh-huh. and so many people had got into it here that they were just like, "Well, there's clearly a market for it." Yeah. And then the pandemic happened, and then they sacked half of them, and then half of them get caught being sex offenders, and then they got rid of it. <laughs> Have the wrestlers did? Yeah. That's oh, quite damning, isn't it? it? So we should probably do a proper intro then. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <yes. laughs> so this episode we are joined by Craig Wilson. Hello, can I keep doing a, a Jim from the office thing into the camera? <laughs> <laughs> Every time do whatever you want to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was an American office reference there. Yeah, which I've not seen. No, I haven't do- seen it either. <laughs> no? British office? I've seen I've, the British office. I've seen yeah. a little bit of the American one and I've struggled because my Gervais loyalist. Well, season one and two... Quite similar, yeah. Well, they had to copy it or they couldn't get budget. Right. So the US office says, we know this works. Copy it, like, literally as close as you can get. And then once it's passed it, people are watching it and then you can go in your own direction. Well, that's kind of what they did with Parks and Rec as well. Parks and Rec, right. series one, is just the office. Yeah. And it's really bad. And then after series one, they go and do their own thing. And it's really, really good. Yeah. Yeah, season one stuff. And then they start abusing Jerry. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, was your intro done? So we need, isn't it? It's I've already it's derailed it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We've, like, <laughs> we've right. been going for like 10, 12 minutes at this point. <laughs> we've just got to the fact we've got uh, Craig Wilson with us today. That's me. Hi. Yeah, so Craig Wilson being a, a comic. Yeah, sure. Musician? Yeah. Sure. Uh huh. Yeah, musician. <laughs> yep. Actor? Mm-mm. Well, if you look up comedy.com, apparently I was in a thing called the Bromley Boys. The Bromley Boys, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was a Bromley footballer in 2008, apparently. What um, was the what was the thing you were telling me about with the trolley full of cucumbers? Oh, I was a, a background extra in a thing on BBC One in like 2008. 13 or 14 or something mm-hmm. it was called britain's favorite supermarket foods and it was just like a magazine show that they only did one episode of but i'm in the background of like six or seven shots because we like they just had to it had to be like they got like all the top like 100 um things that people buy at supermarkets in the uk mm-hmm. and they just put them all into different trolleys right um and my trolley just had like phallic like, <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say. <laughs> like it was like cucumbers and like carrots and like aubergines like that was just all my trolley was full of there was a guy uh who was there and i think he was in my course at uni and he was like can can you swap with me because i don't want to like be on tv with it <laughs> so i was just like yeah i don't care <laughs> and then i ended up getting more screen time than him so who's the who's the real winner exactly took the punt and uh So like you're know, <laughs> filming it through a fried egg. It shouldn't have changed anything. The settings are all. Yeah, it should be fine. Sure, you can you can you can uh, have the screen flipped out so it's facing towards Julie. So if you turn it, yeah. So I always used to say when I was here at uni. Oh, I accidentally left the lens cap on for the whole shoot. <laughs> I'll fix it in post. We'll fix it in post. <laughs> I'll just stick it in black and white. And fix we, it we, we've had some moments of incompetency, but we've not got to that level yet. <laughs> <laughs> that was the thing that I remember that for like every class. David will probably be able to tell you the same as well. Like, because um, David and I went to uni together here, but it was like hey. everyone's. Hey, <laughs> you're in it now. I that. There you go. There you go. Uh, <laughs> uh, is everyone's first year film? They'd forget to like 
like white balance it or like mm. do any of any of the proper settings on the camera. So it was just like I went for an artistic choice of it being in black and white. Yeah, and I did. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you just rubbled one yeah. of our secrets for the <clears throat> photos that we did. <laughs> Funny enough, there was a lot of filmmaking films were in black and white as yeah, well. But yeah. they were like, mm, yes, film noir. Yeah, it's definitely yeah. this film about uh, a guy going to a party and his girlfriend breaking up with him. Really benefited from the black and white um, <laughs> aesthetic you know, that I brought. The, it's the mood. It's yeah. just the emotions. Yeah. Yeah. Polarizing the mise en scene that you had to write in the end of every essay. <laughs> Am I exposing the secrets to yeah. to making sure you pass every essay? <laughs> it's giving me flashbacks. Mise en scene and film noir. What was the what was the lecturer's name? Like in the black hair, short black hair. No, David. no idea. No, I don't know. Let's cut that bit out. <laughs> Just docs, okay? I know his address. Put <laughs> <laughs> up on screen. Um, can we start off talking about? Your music, King okay, Wayne. yes, and it's yourself sure. and who, who's this? Uh, so it's uh, me and one of my best friends, Ruthie Kennedy. Um, we uh, are a. It's I don't even never like ever know what to say, what genre we are. I say we're like a <laughs> pop band because I guess that makes the most sense. Art pop, sure Go for that. Hey, Art I'll pop. put I'll write yeah. that on a form. Yeah, <laughs> in popular or oh, pop is just popular, so we're popular as whatever pop. Yeah, is at I the just. Moment. Yeah, like I just listen to like songs that I like and then I go, oh, I'm just going to like make my own version of that. And I do that on an original Nintendo Game Boy. Yeah, I wanted to ask about that. The music, I thought it was like, it's a wee bit, say like Church's Saber Pulse, but pop, quite cat, like LCD sound system a wee bit as well. I've never listened to a single one no? of songs. No. <laughs> <laughs> I probably have and I've just been like, that sounds cool. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so can you walk us through the Game Boy thing? Because I... How did yeah. you get involved with that? Um, so I always wanted to be able to play an instrument. Um, and the closest I could do was like play the bass guitar, but I had to play it with like three fingers because this finger has like a weird double jointed thing. So like when I try and move it too fast, it just goes like that. So it would just hit the, like it would just go straight and slap the, the strings. Can you hold it up for that camera, please? It would just it would just goes like that. But that's if I, like if I do it slowly, it's fine. But if I pl tried to play like a bass part that was like anything like faster than like a certain tempo, it would every song would just be like dun 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 because I would just hit all the strings. Um, so I just couldn't do it. My brain just doesn't work like music. I can't read music properly. Um, so, but I always wanted to be able to play music, and then I can't remember if I like. I think I heard the music first. Like my friend like showed me stuff on like MySpace and it was mm -hmm. like Saber Pulse, Henry Home Sweet, um, Anna Managuchi, like those kind of guys. Um, uh, like pro folk probably know them. They did like the Scott Pilgrim game soundtrack. Right, yeah. Anna yeah. Um, and then I went to like see them live in Glasgow. That's the first gig I ever went to. Um, so I went to see them live. What age? Um... I remember I was too young to be in the venue without like an adult. So I remember like there was like seven of us just got my friend's dad to take all of us and be our like adult. Um, it was in the cat house. Ugh, I'm trying to remember what eight. I must have been like 14 or 15 or something like that. Yeah. Um, and I really like liked that music, but I didn't know what I was doing to make it. And then I saw this documentary called Reformat the Planet that they had... Uh, the, the production team that made it, Two Player Productions, they had a deal with Penny Arcade, like the webcomic, for some reason right. at the time. Because I think they were making a documentary about them. And then their thing was like, oh, we'll put your documentary up on the website for free. Because I think the DVD had been out of print for a wee while. And it's like documenting the first ever Blip Festival, which is the first ever festival, at least in the West. I think they might have had some stuff in Japan before. But it was dedicated to that type of music, like music made on old games hardware. Mm -hmm. um, so I watched that. And then there's also like behind the scenes bits on the DVD because I eventually bought the DVD because I liked it so much. And uh, the behind the scenes like shows you like, you know, like very like basic tutorials of like how certain guys that were at the festival like made the music. Right. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and so I found out that there's like, like the, I like the Game Boy noise better because I grew up with it. Mm -hmm. So um, I was like, all right, I'm going to research that a bit more. And there's like a couple of like cartridges you could get. So I got like a Nanoloop cartridge, which is a bit more like, um, 
if you're good at it, you're good at it. But it's like it, it just constantly plays sound, and you have like a little grid, like a four by four grid, and you just move little dots about, and then it makes different noises. And you can work out like what note each one of them is, and what each function is. Like there is a manual for it online and stuff like that. But I just thought it was like it was easy to make cool noises, but it wasn't as easy to like make a good song on it. And then there's this other program called LSDJ, which is what I've used from then till now. I got it when I was uh, 18. And um, yeah, so I've been using it since then. And that is just like, it's based off this program on the Amiga. Um, or maybe it was the Commodore 64. It's called Pro Tracker. Um, and it's basically like a top down grid of like numbers and letters. It's in like hexadecimal. And like all the different letters in the hexadecimal like do like a different thing. And then it's got like the note values in it as well. And then I just like, my brain just like clicked with that. I was just like, oh, that makes sense. Like, I, cause I've been using button pads my whole life. Yeah. So as soon as I learned just like what combo of buttons does what on it, I was just like, oh yeah, this is like second nature to me now. So I could make like, I got, I got to the point like where I could just like make a whole song in an afternoon. Like it's not going to be great, but like, I was just like, oh, this is like second nature to me. So it's basically a cartridge that allows you to use the Game Boy's internal noises and it gives you like a grid where you're just picking what notes yeah, and stuff. Yeah, exactly. And then you get like different um, like commands on it as well. So you can make it do like, oh, you can make it do like a slide, like it's on a guitar. You can right. like pitch bend it or, um, yeah. So like, it's basically like, it's not even, I, don't, I think that it, part of why it sounds, you can make some like crazy noises and stuff on it as well. Is like, you're not using the full graphical capabilities because it's literally just like you put some numbers on the yeah. screen. So, um, you can get like a bit more access to the sound chip and then you can basically just use it like a synthesizer and a drum machine. Cool. Um, but you only have four channels in it. And uh, one of them you can put like really, really, really low level, like low quality samples in it. And then one of them is just white noise. So okay. <laughs> so it's very limited, but if you know what you're doing. You... Do you have any examples online that we can throw into this? Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, of my stuff, you can use whatever you want. Like, um, I've got so there's King Wine or albums online, but that's got like vocals and stuff on it. I've got like my solo music on there as well. I think it's on Spotify and stuff. I don't know. Oh really? Yeah, uh, I was, I was or your solo stuff. Yeah, I've got like two different solo things, but one is kind of like a joke thing. Um, I I made this like well, I'll, I'll explain the other thing first. So like I do like my ser serious music, mm -hmm. which is um, uh, I mean like weird kind of like like. Uh, like post rock, prog rock type, like spacey music. Okay. And um, more recently, like I connect like other synthesizers up to the Game Boy, and I'll use it as like a controller. But it's also playing. It's like two Game Boys at once. Um, I can send you a, a photo of like my setup. Yeah, um, that you, cool. you can put in post yeah. because it's like quite. It's like a massive flight case now that I have. That's got like a. Little, they're just like little synthesizers though. They're like the um. I have a, a few like the Korg. Um, uh, what are they called? It's, you're the, you're my synth backup. Volca. Korg Volcas. I've got like two of them. I've got um, yeah, loads of like synths that are like this big, like as big you could hold it in one hand yeah. type of thing. So I have just a flight case full of them, and they're controlled by two Game Boys. Um, so there's that, uh, but maybe that's not a good example of Game Boy stuff on its own. I do another thing, which is like a sort of. It started as a joke, but I guess people like the music. I got booked for it sort of recently in the last year to, to do it. But it's this project I had called um, Duke Flex. And it was like, when I started it, it was like EDM DJs were like the rock stars. You know, it was like when I was in uni and stuff. So like Zed and like David Guetta and all that, like they were like the big music right. stars. So I was kind of like taking the piss out of them. Like I was like, <laughs> I was going about and like, like I'd always wear shades inside and like, say, <laughs> like all my accounts online would only follow one account and it was David Guetta and, <laughs> and like all of my um like all like anytime anyone would like ask me questions I would like answer them in, in character and it would just be like I'd do this for the money like, <laughs> like all that stuff um so that I did I do that all on just one Game Boy I don't even like produce it or anything I literally just like recorded it into the computer like just with a headphone jack right and that's it. um but it's just all dance music so but that that is probably the rawest form so you could use that um 
it's just one Game Boy just making stupid dance music. So, but you should, but you were booked for that. I got booked for that like sort of recently. It wasn't like they were like we need this guy. Um, it was um, my friend was running a like a, a electronic music night, and someone who was supposed to like one of the acts from Manchester like like something happened with the trains and they couldn't make it, and they were like everyone else is sort of playing dance music tonight. Would you do Duke Flex? And I was like, I guess, yeah. <laughs> I still have all the songs on the cartridge somewhere. So then I did it, and then it was like, everyone was like, I, I had no idea. That, like, I've got a whole different like group of people that know me now from, yeah. from like, they never knew that I did that when I was in uni. So they were just like, we didn't know you made like club bangers. And I was like, <laughs> I, ge- I guess. <laughs> I love the name, Duke Flex. Yeah. It also sounds like a wrestler. Yeah, yeah. It well, was kind of what was it? I was making fun of. I was I was specifically making fun of like two different things. I think I was making fun of like um, Duke Dumont. That was a guy that yeah, was about. Yeah. And then I think I was making fun of like maybe it was a wrestler. Maybe it was like Ryback or something like that. Right. Okay. Um, very cynical in my in my <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in my early twenties. Now you're getting booked. It's like I hate this so much. I'm going to rip the piss, but this is what's working for me. So like, yeah, you have yeah, to become yeah. what you hate. Yeah, exactly. That's that. I think that that's maybe an analogy for a lot of comics as well. Yeah, <laughs> just, go, just going to doing like uh, like hack material. <laughs> so in terms of you starting to get into like the DVDs and hear about being able to manipulate the Game Boys and make your music to playing on like doing a performance and releasing music like what was that journey like um i think i think i wanted to do it like right away like i I would write songs to like be performed live like Mm -hmm. that was so like i just didn't care about like releasing it or anything like at the time because it used to be it was like me and like four of my friends like all did it and so every other weekend someone would have like a the proverbial like empty Mm-hmm. and we would just instead of like i mean a lot of people were doing like like drinking and drugs like you would do um when you're like that age but it was more like we were putting on like little gigs in the corner of the room nice and it was for like it was for basically us four and maybe like two other people yeah and everyone else was just like why aren't they why aren't they just there's girls here why, why aren't they, they doing joining like? <laughs> <laughs> um so sidebar i have just found a photo of Oh, in here, Craig's. Um, that this is where we do a snap. Uh, I download it, <clears throat> but yeah, it's a wee throwback to oh, Craig nice. doing a wee Proper. live session on nice. the radio. Yeah, with PS, with PSP as well. Yeah, yeah, I wrote, I wrote songs on the PSP as well. So, so you, you how, can do it with all consoles. I I tried like the Game Boy. I know, like I just I know the ins and outs of that. Like, um, I try. I went through a period where I tried to learn loads of different ones like i tried to learn stuff on the commodore 64 um and the amiga as well but i just like i had to run like a virtual machine on my laptop and like it was so like because i didn't have the hardware for it right yeah um and it was just, it was so much like it was less intuitive than like lsdj's software as well so i just i never really like but the one on the psp it's like it's just the um the Game Boy's like interface, but it's like you have way more options and it's only sample based. Mm-hmm. So I was like, well, I sort of know this already. So I wrote like two songs on that. Um, but it was a pain because I had to hack the PSP to do it, to like run homebrew stuff on it. And then it was so hard to get the songs back off it that I just like was too lazy to keep doing mm-hmm. it. <laughs> but I have this new bit of hardware now. It's called the M8 Tracker. And it's made by one of the guys who like he's developed like so many things for like the Game Boy like DIY stuff. Um it is like art seems like trash eighty. Um and he made this new bit of hardware where it's basically just it's like a Game Boy looking thing. It's got, you know, the same amount of buttons and stuff, but it's like computer keys. And it does the Game Boy synth stuff. It does also like FM synth, which is like if you want to go in game terms, that's like Mega Drive. Um, it's got like other types of synth engines in it. You can also put high quality like wave samples in it, so you can put like lossless like mm. samples in it. There's no sample length. It's only limited by the memory card, and it's a micro SD. It's like the best thing. It's the best. It's the last bit of hardware I'll ever buy because you can like sync it with MIDI, you can do everything. But it's the Game Boy's LSDJ's um, interface, 
So it's just like, oh, I just know how to do this now. Like, <laughs> I didn't have to learn anything new. Yeah, that's intuitive. So how does it, how but does you it can look now, like Sorry, you can, crucially now you can sample farts and put them yeah, in your songs. Yeah, oh, and I can nice. sample the longest farts. There's no, <laughs> there's no limit farts. to the length of them. and go as long <clears> as possible. So, so how does it look on stage? Like, are you... Are you at a desk? Are you like carrying about a Game Boy? Like, <laughs> so you can kind of do whatever. You, so there's like a live mode for the Game Boy, so you can do stuff live on it. And sometimes I will do stuff live just because, like, it's a old. It's like a how old is it now? It's like thirty five years old, right? Um, thirty four, nineteen eighty nine. I don't know. I'm not doing maths right now. Um, but uh, uh, so like you can do live stuff, and, it, and it's like old, so it sounds bad on a lot of speakers mm, okay. so i can like adjust things like as i go but for the most part like you can just hit play because you can just it'll do it'll play all the stuff live it's playing that live from the sound chip mm -hmm. but um you can do whatever level of like live play that you want because you just it's up to you it's up to what you want to yeah. do there's like a lot of anxiety i had a lot of anxiety when i first started performing like sort of regularly with it that it looked like I wasn't doing enough. Because <laughs> um, I remember a guy, um, I went through a very naive period where I would like play at like, local open mics with it. And the, the courtyard bar story. Yeah. Oh, yeah, this is, yeah, this is what it is. Um, so I, I, I did some of the courtyard and there, there was a guy who uh, the host came up to me after the show, like after the, the open mic had finished. And... He was like, I just had to stop a guy from like trying to beat you up. And I was like, why? Like, what did I do? Like, I didn't say anything offensive. None of my songs have words in them. I'm just like, <laughs> just hitting that. And uh, he was like, oh, he thinks that you just went up and hit play on your iPod because he just oh, didn't understand. Right. He yeah. just saw me holding a thing and pre right. like pressing a button on it, and he just didn't get it. And he just he was like a vigilante for lazy yeah. open micers. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he was like, he didn't even sing. He didn't even do anything. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I, I don't know why I did that. <laughs> um, but, yeah, like, that was why I I was, I got sort of paranoid about it. So then, like, for, like, my solo stuff, I just started, like, adding in, like, keyboards and synthesizers and stuff. And then I, now I'm, like, I'm doing too much. Like, I don't know. I miss this. Like, that's why for King Wine, it's, like, we used to have um, other instruments. So we would look like a real band. Mm -hmm. um, so that we could get booked because from my experience of doing music with the Game Boy for years you just they would go oh we'll book you with DJs I used to get booked to play nightclubs and I was like mm -hmm. I don't think people are going to want to like get steaming and dance to like a nine minute prog rock song mm -hmm. like it's just not the right thing but that they just understand it as oh it's electronic so he's a DJ yeah um, so um, I was like right from the bat I was like we'll we'll write some instrument parts for it but uh, for the most part i'm still writing all the song on the game boy um and then eventually as we started getting booked more and folks started to get it we just like pared down the instruments less and less and now i just literally just go up and i hit play i mean we just sing and dance nice and what what's like your songwriting process and are there any parallels with your joke writing um well this like i mean for king wine at least like i'll just go away and i'll write like a song and I'll, and I'll just do it over like I think I said before like I could write it in a day or I could write it in like a few weeks or something and then what I'll do is I'll just send that file to Ruthie and then she'll listen to it and then she'll give me like feedback of like well that doesn't make sense like as a song structure or something like that for me to sing or like I want this bit or whatever um, so she'll send me that back and then I'll basically fix it and then I'll send it to her and then she'll just write the lyrics and then send me a recording of her singing the lyrics and then um, we'll maybe like work on them together. But for the most part, it is such a, like, <laughs> it's so like, I'll just write the song and I'll go, is that good? And she'll be like, yeah. And then like three days later, I'll get back the same like file, but just it's got singing over the top of it. And I'll be like, yeah, that's good. <laughs> so what, you just whip out a song in a day? Do you have like a yeah. process or do you have no, to do a certain just, uh, like no. when I feel like it, I just go, yeah, I'll just do that. <laughs> I haven't, I haven't like written a new one in like, um about like three years now okay but it is because i went through a period of like i would write like one every week mm -hmm. um so i just have this massive bank of them 
like on my computer and I'm sure Ruthie has them on her computer and then when she's trying to write a song she'll just go through them and be like nah, that that I assume that's what she does she just goes that one makes sense you just pull it out then yeah but what we've been trying to do now though is recently so we put our like first album and then we were kind of like well we want it to be like more collaborative for all of the bits of it now so I'm not great at writing song lyrics but I like try and have feedback and then like Ruthie, like I I sort of like gave her a bit of help and she like most of it was like her learning herself, but she's like learning to use LSDJ and stuff. So now it's like I'm sending her songs and then or it's like more actually the songs that I that I'd wrote like three years ago. But and so she's going in and going like changing bits herself because mm. she knows how to do that now and doesn't have to go, Oh well you can you do this and then I have to sort of like work out what she means and things like mm. that. Um so it's a, it is a bit more now, like we can write it like, sort of like a traditional band where we'll go in and practice and write it together. Um, yeah, so that's, that's the new way of, of doing it. And the podcast does need a theme tune. I was literally about to say the same thing. I was like, if you want to do a special intro for this episode. Um, so your songwriting process, you can just kind of whip it out when you feel like that sounds yeah, bad. Yeah, it's just... It's just <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah. Don't, don't have a, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> I'll just bring you along to gigs <laughs> uh, yeah if, if you want to segue into into comedy is your joke writing as does it come as easy to you or is it more of a process um, I think I have to sit down more and just go I'm going to write jokes today mm -hmm. for that but these are all just things that I th think in my brain normally and it's just a case of like articulating them, which is, yes, it's harder. Whereas like a song, I could just be like, I just, I feel like writing a, a drum and bass song and I'll just sit down and do that. And I'll just hyper fixate on that for like mm. days and I'll not stop until I've got it right. Um, whereas like a joke, I'll just like, I'll let them stew in my head for like so long. Like, um, I think I wrote down a joke that I've had in my head for, when did I start comedy? So like, three years ago i think it like it's been sitting in my head and then i just finally articulated it the other day because i was like oh that's that's what i mean to say with Quack, that. yeah <laughs> that's the word that i was looking for um can you give us a gist of um or does it not make sense the like, context i don't know i think like i've got my book here that i'm writing like my current show stuff in so maybe i could look and find it um you another notebook guy then. Say, yeah. Paul, if you if you notice the beautiful art, we had uh, canvases and we all drew each other while we were doing the pod, but <laughs> having canvases in every episode was too expensive. Is that um, a sponsor? If anyone's listening, give me canvases. <laughs> <laughs> that, that camera is recording, right? Yeah. Okay. I've, I've been doing all these gym from the offices. <laughs> Uh, none of these yeah I don't think a lot of these make sense out of the context of the show but I will tell you the last thing I wrote which was do you ever walk into a room and forget why you're there that's the halfway point of every relationship I've ever been in which just sounds more sad than funny <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it is it, 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 it does make context like it does make sense in context of the show I yeah. guess so to bring it back to what Raymond Mern said and like I've, I saw you at the Smoke and Goat as well. You're quite comfortable in sharing your vulnerability. And that's like kind of your, it's like self-deprecating and being vulnerable. It's very kind of raw and your comedy, would you say? Or is that? I guess, you're... yeah. I just don't like, I'm, I'm a chronic oversharer. Okay. Like, so I'll just tell, like, <laughs> it's really weird. Like, um, I moved in with my girlfriend kind of recently and um, I just keep having these like moments where she goes, you didn't need to tell me that. <laughs> like, not not like she didn't want to know, but she was just sort of like, that's not information I need. <laughs> Any examples of that? I'll yeah. just be like, I'll, I, I, I mean, I guess I'll go on the tamer side where I'll just be like, uh, I, was, I was brushing my teeth and I sneezed at the same time and it went everywhere and she's just like, <laughs> as long, I don't need to know that. Like, did you clean it up? Then yeah, that's not information. I need. I'm making it sound really rude here, but it is more just like <laughs> I will share like probably disgusting things about my day. That right. like she'll just be like, that's not like like I'll tell her about like my my bowel movements or whatever, and she'll just be like, I don't need to. <laughs> that's not, yeah. I was taking a shit, brushing my teeth, and I sneezed at the same yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> and I exploded. <laughs> <laughs> How pushed for time are you in the morning? <laughs> <laughs> well, i got to clean up if I've exploded everywhere. Like, Too many ages. Have you ever combined your music and comedy? Because I know you were on last night with Amelia Bailey. She does like songs and stuff sometimes, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, I tried it for a little bit. And it's so funny like seeing um, when other comics find it. Because I sort of don't tend to like cross from like pollinate them mm-hmm. like um uh, and, and it's like so like i did a gig at christmas for it was like a charity show and it was mostly comics on but there was like a couple of musical acts and they were like we did like a christmas cover song and stuff and um and it was like a lot basically the first time a lot of my like comedy like colleagues had like seen me do music stuff mm-hmm. and a lot of them were like visibly angry at me like <laughs> You could be the Game Boy guy. Yeah. <laughs> you could you could be the most unique guy in not just British comedy, just comedy. And I was just like, but it's not funny to me. But right. how, how do you take those two entities and merge them together for a set? I, d- I don't know. That's the thing. Is like but I how- used to like I used to like go up with my Game Boy and I'd plug it in. And then anytime I would do like a really because I used to do like proper like dad jokes, and I, I would go up and I would do like a, like just a bad joke. And then I would have like, like a you know like your your, was it that one? <laughs> Jeez, um, I would have that, but I'd made it on the Game Boy, right? So right. it sounded like sounded like it was from like a game, um, and it was just like I mean it's kind of funny, but you know only really do that like three times maximum. Yeah, like people are not, um, you know it's it's only a gimmick. You know, mm-hmm. I, I have to actually be funny to. <laughs> yeah, it's not got any substance behind it, but it does add something. Yeah, it's like it, it'll be unique, but it won't be like good for an hour. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. Because like, if you like, I feel like Bill Bailey is like incredibly funny as well as being an amazing musician. Mm-hmm. Like, if he just went up and played all those instruments and stuff, it'd be like, oh, that's interesting, but it's not. It's not a comedy show. No. Um, it would just be a fun show, um, and I don't really know how to do that. Like, I guess like there's there's elements of comedy to King Wine when we do live stuff. Like, I'll do jokes in between. Like, and we did like our um, our album launch show. We had an ad break in the middle, uh, and we just had these fake adverts that I'd made. Right, like and they're all skits. yeah, and they were, and it was really just so that we could like go behind the projector screen and have a drink of water and stuff like that. Um, but like just yeah things like that like i do funny things with king wine but i wouldn't ever say that it's like because I, I barely ever write stuff for that like well maybe we have a moment sometimes before we go on stage and we'll go all oh, right this is the bit for tonight like and we'll just do this running gag throughout the whole set okay um but it's never anything that's like oh this is material you know mm. and i can't really find a way of doing that the other way as well because i can't really do none of our songs are funny like we'll do funny things when we promote the songs or like when we perform the songs mm-hmm. but like they're they're just songs that we wrote and then we sort of do fun things around them yeah um so i wouldn't really know how to write a funny song i can't really write the lyrics to our songs normally <laughs> <laughs> um and i could do i was like i used to do like i'd make like a little sound effect and stuff like that but again it doesn't last longer than five minutes max mm-hmm. um so when you first started stand up was that the dad jokes in Game Boy, and then you transitioned away. Yeah, I, I only did like three gigs with that. Okay. Like I did one in like an open mic cabaret thing that like um like a friend of a friend ran in Glasgow, and they they just like needed acts, so mm-hmm. I, I did that. Um, and then the other two were in like in the student union, um, okay. where it was just an open mic for whatever. And I had an out at the end of like, if my jokes aren't funny, then I have all my songs loaded up on here anyway. <laughs> So at the end of my set, I would just play a normal like dance music song, um, and I would just that was like my out for like if none of this is funny, I'll just like hit play on a song. Yeah, just how pretend that you were there to do the whole time. How did those first gigs go then? Um, the ones in the student union were always funny because like I, I worked there as well, so people knew me. Um, and whenever I would play that last song, I, like, the both times I did it, for some reason, I, I, maybe because they put me on near the end. But folk would just go wild. And I don't even know if it was necessarily a good song. But like one time I did it, a guy just did a backflip in front of me. <laughs> like he just walked up, did a backflip, and they just high fived me and left. And I was like, I don't know. But so it was but I was sort of like, I don't feel funny. 
I just feel like I went up and was weird for five minutes. Yeah. Um, and then the one that I did in uh, Glasgow, I felt like I was doing all right because I was just being like really, really like alt comedy, like doing like sort of like Tim Heidecker or what I thought was Tim Heidecker style okay, yeah. um, comedy. And then someone was uh, shouted out a transphobic thing in the middle of it. And then I just shouted at them for the rest of my set. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think I did well at that either. You're so, a fan of, uh, I think you should leave. Yeah, Tim Robinson, yeah. yeah. I think it's the best, like, I mean, the Noah's doing sketch comedy now, but yeah. it's the best sketch comedy thing that we've got. A hundred percent. So good. I love it. Do yeah. you think when it comes to comedy performing, if your audience knows you slightly, that helps uh, them relax into the experience or do you think it works against you? Just because when most people buy a ticket to go to a, a show like for like bigger named comedians, they know what they're going into. They know they like that person, they like that style of comedy. And so like they know they're going to enjoy the, that person but when you go to see people who are sort of lesser known like open mics and things like that, you're turning up and you're like this is a take so you're sort of taking a shot in the dark you're not sure if the person's going to like you're not going to jail with their comedy or the people who are going to see that night do you think you've when you've got like an audience that knows you slightly they're slightly invested in you and want you to do well so i guess i, I have kind of a weird relationship to that style of thing because i do so many like open mics and new act nights and things like that because i'm quite low down on the totem of, of like <laughs> comedy um i have sort of catered my set to being an unknown guy like so i can come out and be weird and they go oh who's this, this weird guy like and then yeah. i can play off of that sort of unknown um uh but last night um i did a fringe preview with amelia bailey that we're talking about and 90% of the audience knew me personally. Right. Um, and I'd say this not in a negative way. I didn't do well. Like, I, I would not do well at that show. I don't think, I, I didn't, I wouldn't say that, like, I died, like, I would do badly at a gig. But everything that I said was so easily disprovable, like, like mm. by them, because they were like, well, we know that's all made up right okay but if it's a different audience then i i think that like like i i feel like i do better to a, a whole room of people who have never heard of me yeah but that is also because i've written an hour of material on being the most forgettable man in the world like mm -hmm. that is what my friend show is about right um so that that's kind of part of it i think there's a good the, the proper middle ground of that is finding your own audience but they don't know you personally mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um because i think like when you see I was talking to someone about this like a wee while ago. Like when you see like a comedian gets to the stage where they just have their audience and they're going to come to all their shows, it's almost like I can't tell if that would do as well in like a comedy club on a weekend mm -hmm. because the people that are there already know they're going to like them. Yeah. Um, that, but I'm not at that stage yet. <laughs> I can either get my sorry. friends and my mum's friends to come, <laughs> or I'm doing it to to. Total strangers. Mm -hmm. get up. I was like seeing Bill Barr in Edinburgh. His first five minutes were just ad reads from his podcast. I don't know if you ever <laughs> heard it, like Zip Recruiter and everything. Right, yeah, uh, yeah. But he just started naming like American companies and everyone's like, ha <laughs> ha I was like, if, if you just take this out of context, it'd be like the worst comedy yeah. gig ever. Yeah, like I sometimes see people and they're just like, like as I'll go and see like comedians tour shows and stuff like mm. that and it's like, oh, like, oh, that's the person that's been brought and they don't know who what this is mm -hmm. and they've referenced something that, like oh, it's on their podcast or like something that they they did in their last show or something like that. Yeah, like um, John Mulaney's latest special, like that. I can't imagine watching that as your first time seeing him, because the whole first fifteen minutes is about his quite public like drug problems that he had. Then he went to rehab and all this stuff, and but he never like says exclu like explicitly what that is until fifteen minutes into the show mm. because it's like a cold open almost. And it's like, oh, that well, he's doing that gig to his audience anyway. Yeah, like no one's going to see that for the first time. Yeah, so you you've really got to be you got to be knowledgeable about who you're playing to. I think so. I think that's like one of the hardest things to learn. I'm still learning it. Yeah, and how long have you been involved with comedy now? So I started in 2018, but then I didn't do anything over 
like lockdown. No, because I just like a lot of my friends did like Zoom stuff, and that'd be really difficult. And I just, I just couldn't do it. Like I tried doing it in the mirror, as it like pretending I was doing it on Zoom. Yeah, and it just made me like cringe so much that I was just like, no one will find this funny. Is this the like the stand did a show every week? They or would do, like that? they would do one like um, quite regularly. Um, but I think that the stuff that they would do was they get you to send in like sketches instead. Right. Like okay. my friends sent in some sketches. I did see some people who would just do like a piece to camera, mm -hmm. but it was anyone could do it. Like anyone could send stuff in. Right. Um, but even that, I was just like, I don't want to do this. It looked, it looked really tough. I, th I think, I think Fred McCauley did one. His was hilarious. But then there was a couple of people who I'd seen live and they were really funny, but just on webcam. It you're just doesn't translate. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a tough, tough gig. <laughs> Especially like if you're just doing a routine. Yeah. Like, it's just like, oh, did I leave a pause for laughs? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Because if I tried. don't, and then it is funny, then they'll just, then I'm just, they're laughing through something I'm saying. Yeah, you know? that's in the setup for the next one. Yeah. So, yeah, um, before we move off of your audience, how long was it into your relationship before you, uh, like, has, has your girlfriend seen you live? And yeah. Did you caveat it as, like, you need to see me, like, three times to get a gist, or did you pick a gig in particular? Or? <laughs> I picked the absolute worst yeah. gig for her to come and see me. Um. Because I think I think that she, like I never asked her like I didn't ask her like that early sort of stage like I told her that I was a comedian like right away because mm -hmm. it was like you're gonna need no this is all I talk about how long have you been saying. together um I think five years now I think oh, this we'll this cut the pause out there this October it will be five years right um, good answer so um but it was just I think it was just because we were trying to like work it around like um like jobs and uni and stuff like that when we could like go on dates and stuff like that and then it was like the only day that both of us were off that week we, it was like i was supposed to finish work early and then do a gig that night and then she was like well i'll just come to the gig and then we can hang out afterwards yeah and i was like okay and then it was like a gig that was in yes bar when that was still open yeah although i hear that's going to open back again soon and it's just plumbing problems it's gonna be it's gonna be fine it's not it's never opening again um uh and it was like a workshop gig so like um how, how long into the relationship was this uh i think it was a couple of months okay. maybe two three months um and it was like a workshop gig like sort of graduation -y type gig. there's a comedian obi that i think you yeah. saw that i did the gig with in the smoke and go so he's like my comedy dad. Like he sort of like kind of. I did his like course when I started, and he like gave me advice and he still gives me advice and stuff like that. Okay. Um, and uh, he uh, was doing like a one of his workshops, sort of graduation gig. Um, and because I'd done it before, and I was one of the folk that was like sort of still doing gigs, he was like, "Do you want to come and do it? And you can be on and like sort of show them." what what it's like if you keep doing gigs after this thing. yeah because i think a lot of people would would do it for not just comedy they do it for like public speaking and stuff like that right and um so i went and did that gig but i was i was oh we got a, <laughs> i was so loud. like a street I, I heard that on my head <laughs> 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 i need to excuse our sound guy to go do a shit <laughs> <laughs> You got a button for that one? <laughs> <laughs> you sample it. <laughs> I'll use that. I'll put that in the Game Boy. I'll yeah. bit, bit crush it to four. We can edit this out, but I actually yeah. had that at work this morning. <laughs> I, was to I was on a call and they were going like case by case and I thought my turn was going to come up soon, but my stomach was like just going crazy. And I had to take the laptop into the bathroom like on mute, off webcam. Oh, like, no. Please don't speak to me. Please don't speak to me. <laughs> <laughs> Daryl Buchanan. Yeah. <laughs> Why is it echoing when you're speaking? <laughs> I'm really sorry, but that's no way is that coming out of this. <laughs> so where were we? Uh, your girlfriend. Oh, the gig. first gig that she came to. So, um, yeah, so uh, I was supposed to finish my shift, go meet her, have a couple of hours, like have a drink or something, go do this gig. I think I didn't even have to be there for the whole gig. I think I just like was supposed to turn up and do my bit and then leave. Um, and uh, my work, I think someone was off sick or something like that. And 
then I got into a row with like the guy who was in the business next door to us because we had like the same seating area and we were supposed to have like a rota of like who would clean the seating area and then he was just like he was like it's your day and I'm like it's not I, I didn't know there was like hey, whatever so there's a whole thing where I had to clean the whole seating area and like some kid had like just destroyed a table <laughs> and I had to clean it and I was like two hours late to when I was supposed to meet her mm. and I was just like I think I'm just gonna have to meet you at the gig. Didn't have time to go go home, get changed. So I had my, all my work clothes on. I was just like covered in like mm. like food and stuff. <laughs> like um, so I show up to this gig, um, covered in like I had like sour cream stains on me and stuff like that. Did everyone think it was a bit? I I, I don't know. I feel like I tried to block most of that night out. Yeah. Um, but then, so we do the 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 show, and I say to Obi, I'm like, don't. Please don't speak to her. She's like, we've only been going out for a little bit. She's quite anxious about being at this. Don't talk to her. And especially <laughs> don't mention that it's my girlfriend because all of my comedy was written before I had a girlfriend. Oh, don't speak to her when he's performing. Or, yeah, like, Because like, he, he was hosting it. So right, it's like, okay. don't do crowd work on her. Okay. Because um, oh, it will right, give right. away half of my material. Like, yeah. It'll make it wrong. And of course, the first thing he did was, was speak to her. <laughs> I don't know if he just forgot or if he was trying to test me or what, but he did that and I was like, cool, that's all my jokes ruined. Um, and then some guy went up and he decided he was going to do crowd work on her and he just said the most heinous stuff that she, like, like everyone was raging at him. I was like, what are you doing? Like clearly stuff he'd not prepared in the class. Right. And he just was talking about like, I, I, I won't repeat it. I refuse to repeat it. It was disgusting. And then she, like, it just made her like really kind of like, is this what gigs are? Yeah. <laughs> is this what you have to do? So it wasn't because you bombed? Like, no, I went, hey, I smashed it. <laughs> <laughs> the bar was set low after that, guy. Yeah. So um, you, your part like, brought it back up then? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, when you set the bar low, like the, a guy only doing half his material and half of his material it doesn't make sense because his girlfriend has been out, it has been in the audience. Yeah. Uh, um, still, I still did better than the, than the guy before me. So seeing when it um, comes to your comedy, we asked Billy this, do you feel there are things that are off limits in terms of content and what you can say? Um, I you think... you spoke about that guy saying pretty heinous stuff. I mean, it's, it's it different when you're targeting like, a person as well. That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think, like, the thing was, like, it wasn't even, like... I don't even mean heinous as in, like... You, no. <laughs> I, 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 he wasn't saying stuff that was, like, bigoted or racist or anything like that. Um, but he was saying stuff that was like quite disgusting and it was clear that she was like uncomfortable and like yeah. we were being like move on mm. and he was like just, just do it um, I, will, I will say like I don't want to protect Obi's like reputation of doing his workshops like that guy doesn't do a comedy anymore yeah. um, because of like stuff like that <laughs> um, uh, but uh, yeah like I, th I mean, like, that was just kind of, like, mean and malicious because he saw that she was, like, uncomfortable and he like, just kept doing it. Um, I think you can... My policy's always been you can say whatever you want, but you have to face the consequences of what you've said. Like, there's, like... I mean, it's the whole thing of, like, cancelling people in comedy and stuff like that. It's like, you're not really cancelled because the guys that talk about that, they've got their own circuit now, basically. Mm -hmm. There's that, like... Um, I don't know what it is. There's like a type, there's a gig or like a tour of gigs and it's like, they basically just go, oh, you can say whatever you want here. And it's like, it's not really, it's, you can just say stuff that's kind of horrible to people and get away with it. Mm -hmm. um, it's even like, I can't think of any comedians you'll probably know better that are actually like career ended cancelled. Because even um, like, like Lucy K still touring, yep. Crystal Lee is back on form, like everyone that's Ricky Gervais has his trans stuff he's not affected at all no one's actually been cancelled but it's a big conversation in comedy yeah i don't like i feel like i'm so burnt out on that conversation because i was in like a tv program that was about it that we filmed for like three hours is that cancel cancel karen, cancel and, karen and, Bar. and Bar. it was on bbc scotland um and we filmed for like three hours and then they like edited it all out <laughs> all <right. laughs> um I don't know. It's just like I feel like it's just like my my policies never never really change. Like you can say whatever you want. Like it's just like yeah, you you, if it. if people are upset by it or like people don't want to book you anymore after it because they they think that it's 
you know, disgusting what you've said or whatever, like you have to deal with that. Mm -hmm. You can still say that stuff after that as well. Mm -hmm. No one is stopping you. It's just like they've got the right to Not to book their you. own stuff. Yeah. yeah. Like they're if they know their audience don't like it, then why would they book you? No, it makes no sense. Because like why why would they go Oh, well, you came and said a load of racist stuff last time and the audience hated it. But freedom of speech. Here's this racist guy again that everybody hates. Like, it just doesn't work. It doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, it seems to be like an appealing line of comedy for a lot of people, but it needs to be done so intelligently and tactfully. Like, say, like, Andrew Schultz, he's known for being really offensive and stuff, but he 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 does a lot of research into, like say, like different regions of places and he knows his stuff. It's not just... Attacking yeah, people because of like a race or whatever. I don't know. It's such guess. a fine line. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Is he is he is he good? Yeah, he's pretty good. He's got yeah, that, that, that's weird. <laughs> <Ask> that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he did a lot of stuff over lockdown. He blew up quite a lot because he was he was writing and then recording and putting stuff up for free on Instagram and YouTube right. and stuff like that. And he gained a lot of traction through that spell because there was a there was a gap where no one else was really doing the same types of work so that helped him massively i think were you ever tempted to do comedy as mr flex i don't think it would be very funny <laughs> no. to be honest because it was like all like you like at the time it was dated like i was <laughs> making fun of like dj culture which is like not not i think i'm even really a part of anymore yeah. it would just be like because i kept getting booked with djs i would see the kind of like because I wasn't really a part of it, I was just going to kind of go like, do you see yourselves? Mm -hmm. Like, do you, like they couldn't see the funny side of it. Mm -hmm. And that was why I did it. Um, and that's not even really a thing anymore. Like, I think, I feel like obviously they're still like big massive DJs, but they're not like the, the mainstream pop stars they used to be. Yeah. So I feel like it's just like a pastiche of a guy that's not even really about it anymore. Okay. <laughs> um, but I would still do like, I'd do like little character things like, I still, even whenever, whenever I refer to him, uh, a, a, any type of music thing, I still pretend he's a different guy. Right. Just, I'm just like, oh, I'm, I'm just his intern. Like I just post for him, like <laughs> things like that. Um, we have like, I've made like a sort of like cinematic universe for King Wine, where like I'll do like I'll, I'll just mention him offhand. Like I've, I've, I've got to think of like. Uh, an example of a terrible guy i just go oh this guy i know duke flex like and i just i just use him <laughs> as the example every time but i don't like i, I couldn't do it as as him i don't think yeah. it, all, all the jokes wouldn't make sense now so, unless the joke is guy who who got frozen in 2015 and then <laughs> got unfrozen now i remember like zach galifianakis is in an interview and he talks about he tried this whole set like what you're saying like a he was coming out as like a an Edwardian or something. They had like a tunic and everything on, <laughs> and he thought it was hysterical and it just fell flat like ten times. He's like, right, <laughs> yeah, I'm that's the thing this. is like, I've I've rarely ever tried to do like character comedy mm -hmm. unless you count like the version of me that's on stage. Um, but I I feel like it's like at least when I used to do uh, sort of try to do sort of character stuff, um, if it's kind of one joke like over and over. Like in this in a con or at least it's one context for jokes over mm -hmm. and over. So like if if people don't buy into that one mm -hmm. part of the character, then you just sort of can't say that. Yeah. Um Yeah. Do you, do you have like Billy was saying one of the things he found most helpful in comedy was finding out who your guy is and it took him a while and he says his was Robin Williams. Do you think you have a guy or who was like your influence? Um, I think I have two guys. Um, uh, I think that I love John Mulaney because I think he's a really good like joke writer. Um, and he's like, I feel like for me just now, the peak of like sort of modern American comedy, from my like uh, point of view. And then the guy that sort of made me want to start doing comedy myself was James A. Caster. Yeah, yeah. Because um, I just watched like all of Repertoire back to back with my brother. So and then I was just like, this guy gets to be weird, but he also gets to like write jokes as well. Because mm -hmm. I think sometimes people are just one or the other. Um, but he, he, he was like the first guy that I saw. And I know there's been guys like that. I mean, I, 
like Milton Jones and stuff like that. He's like a guy who's obviously selling weird, but he just writes a million jokes. Yeah. Like, but he was the first guy that I'd, that I'd seen that made me want to go like, I, I'm going to give it a go. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just like, I, I even after that, like I, I saw his, um, his, not his most recent tour, but like the one before the pandemic, like Cold Lasagna, Hate Myself, 1999. Yeah. Like I saw that live and I was just like, he's done it again. Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> he's knocking out of the park. Um, so I think I'm sort of like, I try and be a bit of both of them, which I, I guess is maybe like doesn't fit because John Mulaney's quite this like confident guy wearing a suit, mm-hmm. like um, owns everything he says. And James Icaster is this weird guy who's saying all these like weird metaphors for like what he's actually trying to say and things like that. Like doesn't really fit together, but those are my two guys, I guess. Right, okay. I just finished Classic Scrapes a few weeks ago. Uh, oh, James like the, the, the book. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely love him as well. Um, yeah, he's brilliant. I've not seen John Mulaney though, but I won't watch his latest special. Then I'll start. start yeah, like just like I, I, what I would say is like the good viewing order is like if you're going to watch the newest one, watch any of them before that. Okay, and then all you really need to know is that during lockdown he had to go to rehab because he had like a mega drug drug problem. Okay, um, and then you'll know the first 15 minutes of the new special okay. is about. Um, but yeah, any of his, like any of his specials for me are just like gold joke writing. Yeah. I don't even think, I like, I wouldn't even like go as far to say as like, he's the best, but he's just like the best for me at like joke writing. That's how I want to write jokes. Mm-hmm. I, I so many jokes that he does that I'm like angry. I didn't come up with it. Yeah. They're, they're like, Oh, that's silly and smart. I hate that. <laughs> <laughs> How how did you get involved with comedy? What was there was a catalyst in your life that prompted? Um, I, I kind of like so I'd always wanted to do it, and I like I wanted to do it since I was like a little kid. Like I saw, I used to watch like um, like Billy Connolly and like Richard Pryor and stuff like that. You know, at night when I was allowed, like well, I wasn't really allowed, but like when I could <laughs> switch the TV on and get away with it, and I watched them. Um, and I was like, oh, I really want to do that, but then I never really had the confidence. So I was like, oh, I'll go to uni to do like, like TV and stuff like that, because then I can at least work with those people. Um, and then I was going out with someone when I was in uni, and they were kind of encouraging me to to sort of do it, but they were also like quite frustrated at how like wishy washy I was with like you know, like doing things that I wanted to do. I didn't really have any hobbies. That time. I was kind of like a bad period of my life. <laughs> like I didn't have any hobbies. Um, all my friends had moved away. Um, my only personality trait was that I was her boyfriend type of thing. And I think she was quite frustrated with that as you would be. Um, and then she broke up with me and I do so many things in my life out of spite that I was like, I'm going to become a, <laughs> such a great comedian that you'll be annoyed that you had the confidence in me. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm yeah. still the bad guy in this, you know? <laughs> so you're like, sort of coming out to prove somebody wrong then. A little bit. Yeah, yeah. So I was just like, I was kind of like annoyed. That was like, well, I'm going to, I'm. I'll show you that I do have the confidence mm. to do this. Um, but it was really just for myself. You know? <laughs> it's really just like, oh, no, I'll just do it because I have an excuse to do it. Because if I because if it fails, then I can just say I'm just having a breakdown. It's fine. Like, <laughs> I don't actually think I'm funny. <laughs> and did that you en- did you enjoy it immediately, or did yeah? You have, did you have to like learn to enjoy the performing side of it? I I did it in such a stupid way. I had listened to like an interview with uh, Sinbad. I don't know if you know Sinbad. He's in like he's the the guy who's opposite Arnold Schwarzenegger in Jingle All the Way, like I think that's what people know him from. Okay, um, he's like a. You know, I honestly thought you meant Sinbad, as in like the, the sailor. The sailor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but yeah, he's like you know kind of old school comic. I get old school for me, like nineties comic. Um, and uh, he, I, I heard an interview with him, and he talked about how when he started doing stand up, he was in like the military, I think. And he'd just go, yeah, I would just go up and like not prepare anything. And the guy who was interviewing him was like, but surely like, you did it once and then you saw stuff that worked and then you like kept it. And he was just like, yeah, just go up and do it. <laughs> just go up and have fun. So and then people move. would love that I was having fun. And I was just like, guess I'll do that. So like the first like, 
apart from those first three times that I was talking about where I went up with the Game Boy, mm-hmm. when I went up to just do stand up, I just didn't write anything. I just went up and I was just like, I'll just find something funny. Um, and I think I was almost like, I was in too supportive of an environment because I would do it at like poetry nights because I didn't know how to get booked for comedy nights. So I'd just go up and do it at like poetry open mics and they would just be like, oh, he's, tr- he's trying. <laughs> <laughs> I sort of whole sink or swim attitude to have towards performing though. Yeah. Do you, would you ever go back to that and play around with that instead of going up with written material? Um, I actually, I've been, I've been kind of having like the urge to like do it recently because yeah. I've been, I've been seeing like, um, like other comics that I like that I really like respect and stuff go and do like work in progress shows, and I'm doing like a work in progress like run at the fringe this year and stuff. Um, but that's material that I've written for like the last three years. Um. But it's just me like working out how to get it into like a good show order and stuff like that. Um, there's comedians I like respect and stuff like that that are doing like work in progress shows, and they just go up with like I've written like four jokes, and I need to work out what my show is for next year. And I'm like, that sounds like very morbidly fun. Mm-hmm. Like just going up and just going like we'll we'll have a chat, and then something I'll record it, and then something will come from that, and that sounds really fun to me, even though. Probably not fun for an audience. <laughs> do you think, like, throwing yourself into that situation where you either are going to do or die, does your brain? Work well, it makes you funnier, or at yeah, least to me, it makes me funnier. Yeah. So, do do in terms of ideas or the actual performance? Um, I think kind of both. Like, I think I'll go up with like, because this is a thing I've been doing recently, where I have a routine that I've written specifically for my show, and I just don't know how to end it. Like, I don't know how to do it and then go into the next part. Uh-huh. So I just go, well, I'll be so frustrated that I'll not be able to end this joke that I'll say something and maybe it'll work and maybe it won't. But it'll get you there. But it'll, it'll do something and then I'll go, okay, like, and now I know either what to do or what not to do. Yeah. That's my experience from my two work in progress shows I've done so far. Um, but I actually did that because I heard um, there's a guy I met at the Fringe He's he's like really really popular just now. Um, Vittorio Angeloni. Yeah. Um, and he said that he goes up on stage sometimes with like he he's got he's got an end into a joke that like doesn't work, but he's hoping that like the pressure of having to entertain the audience without having that bit that works will make him, we'll get him there. think of something because he's just like forced to do it. Um, and since I've tried that, I'm like, oh yeah, that sort of does work. Like, because um, it's so much different to like say it out loud than to write it on the page. Like, I feel like anything I write, I never say it exactly how I've written it. Because mm-hmm. if I did, it would just sound unnatural. Yeah. So I think it's just like another version of that. Like, you just say, like, oh, I don't have the ending for that. I've got a silly thing that doesn't make sense, but I'll say it and then I'll go, oh, like that. Like, because yeah. <laughs> you're trying to explain it to someone, you're like, oh, that's funny. Like, that explanation is funny. So you started off with like quite a off the cuff. Uh, I mean, you can't, can't even call it a writing style but performing style and now are you are you more do you go in very prepared or are you still I like to strike a middle ground because after I did those ones where I went up and said like had nothing I did like my first gig in like a proper comedy night and I totally died of Mars <clears throat> and I was like, oh no, like I have to write like really rigid and like re- it has to be really, really, really <clears throat> like properly set out. So then I did Red Raw at the stand and my feedback was uh, something like to the effect of like incredibly over rehearsed, mm-hmm. something like that. <laughs> and I was like, okay, it needs to be a balance. It needs to be a middle ground. Like it needs to seem like I'm just coming up with it. But like what I'll do now is like, especially when I do like club sets, I'll I have like five minutes or ten minutes, and I'll go up with like if I'm doing a five, I'll go up with like three. So then I go, if something comes up, then I'll just run with it. Yeah. And I've like I've got the confidence. I've been doing it long enough now that I've got the confidence to run with it. And if that's not working, then I've got other material in the bank anyway um, can- that I can just do. How are you with? Because I've heard a lot of people talk about like extreme highs and extreme lows after a good or a bad performance. Like, do you get, do you like carry it home with you, or do you get affected a lot? Or absolutely, absolutely, my poor girlfriend. Because uh, <laughs> I, if I haven't done well, I'll sit and just like, I won't even like say it to her. I'll just be in the same room as her, and then I'll just say out loud like, right. So I think that that and this is why that happened, 
um and this is why that and, and i need to change that and that should go around there and like stuff like that and but then on the other end like if i've done well like i just won't sleep that night because mm -hmm. i just have the adrenaline even if I've done bad, usually I'll probably still have the adrenaline. But like, if I do well, like it's just like I just won't sleep, even though I, I'm like, even though it won't even be like that big an achievement. You know what I mean? Like I'll I'll have done a new material gig in like Hamilton or something like that. But I made those like six regulars like laugh so hard one of them slapped their knee, and I'm just like, oh, yes, <laughs> yes, that's that's gonna that's gonna fill me with joy for like the next two days. That's class. How often does uh, your girlfriend come watch you? And do you use her as a as a sounding board for ideas and editing what you're working on? I definitely, yeah. Like I'll, <laughs> she'll be in the other room, and I'll just go. So this here, that's, that's funny. And she'll be like, oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's never a good start. Yeah, and I gotta just like explain, like, like um, very. I think now that we live together, like she's been um more like brave enough to like to give me like actual criticism as, especially right. as a person who's like i wouldn't say she's like a comedy fan she likes comedy like she'll watch comedy with me and she'll come to gigs with me and stuff like that um not just ones that i'm on like just ones that i want to go and see and stuff like that so she likes comedy but she's not like a person who goes like oh that joke works because that like i'll dissect everything yeah um but like i think from she's through osmosis of being around me is like i i did a thing where i saw um an interview with Susie McCabe and she said that like she does her whole tour show or like her friend show to like her partner and like the living room just so that she's like said mm. it like she's done, done it all in one go so I asked if I could do that with my girlfriend <laughs> and she like gave me like proper feedback and stuff and I was like that's one of the most helpful things I've ever had it's just like because it's from a person who's like I can get as much advice from comedians but like they're too involved in it now yeah and it's like weird to ask an audience to give me a written feedback. So it was really nice to like have her to go. She's she's like one of the problems that I had when before I did my first um work in progress was um she was like, You just come in and you like rattle off jokes. And I don't really know, like obviously I know who you are, but the audience will not know who you are as a person. So why should they care about these things you're saying about yourself if you haven't really like set up who you are they've got to be invested in you as a person yeah exactly so she was looking at it like like a sort of like play you know what i mean yeah and she was just like like even though it's supposed to be funny like i have no idea who this character you're playing Still is. Got to be a story that like threads the whole thing together. it doesn't even it doesn't have to be like i think a lot of good comedy shows are just going up and doing jokes but i think you still have to use that first part of the show to go oh this is kind of his vibe like this is what he's all about and um, the other thing that she said to me recently was Craig, you are obsessed with overcomplicating every joke that you do. Like, I, she's like, it. Sometimes it's more important for it to be smart to you than it for it to actually be Work. funny. Yeah. Um, and I was like, oh, I needed to hear that. <laughs> I suppose that's the, the difference in perspective of someone who you're a comedy fan, but I like, I just enjoy comedy as someone who just watches it. It doesn't matter to me how how well written the joke is if it makes you laugh it makes you laugh and that's a visceral reaction yeah. to like the content so yeah if, if, but from a writing perspective and i suppose it's similar when we're editing different like projects it's very easy to get hung up in the minute of like the detail of things oh, but absolutely actually does it look cool and does it tell you the story about what it is you're trying to promote or, yeah. or what the story is yeah that's the direction you should be really traveling in then Mm -hmm. yeah i mean that's the that i like i found that like especially when I'm, I'm like writing a full show for the first time because it's like oh i need to get to this piece, piece of information in the shortest amount of words and in the clearest way possible yeah. um and it's a lot harder than just writing some one-liners like absolutely because you've got a limited amount of time to play with when you're on stage exactly yeah i've only got this the, the venue for an hour you know yeah like that kind of thing so I suppose that's the benefit of someone who's not deep in comedy to give you feedback because that's really who it's for. Apart exactly. from you say you're one-off yeah. nights where you're performing to comedians who might appreciate like the smart jokes more. Um, but do you think now that you're deep into comedy, say when you go to other shows, has it taken the shine off of seeing other people a bit or do you only like like a, to yeah. a certain tier of comedy? A little bit, a little bit. Like I had, there was a point where I was watching, I can't remember who it was, 
but I was watching like a like a Netflix special or something recently, and um, there was they did a routine, and I was like, that would never work in a club. And I was, <laughs> it's like, that's so cynical. I was like, you're laughing. Why are you thinking that? Yeah. Um. So it's just like sometimes I think things like that. Um. But also, I feel like I appreciate stuff a lot more now as well because I know like how long it must have taken someone to like to write that or to get that just right or something mm. like that. Um, people who like ha- come on and like they just have like a pr- proper defined character as well that you can tell right away. I'm just like, oh, that's that's so hard to do right mm. off the bat. Like, and I can appreciate that more now than just going, oh, that's a weird guy or that's a, <laughs> that's a smart guy, you know. Mm-hmm. How long did it take you to like find your your voice? I think I'm still doing it. Yeah, I think I'm still trying to find it. How many gigs are you in roughly? Like, oh, like I've lost count. Like okay. I've done. I think I stopped counting at like a hundred, mm-hmm. but I've done like that's probably quite a lot. Mm-hmm. I've I, I've I've definitely done thousands at this point. Okay, because like, even at the fringe alone, I'll do like I don't know, like forty of them or something. Okay, as if I'm doing a full run. I'm not. I'm not doing a full run this year, but I'm still going to try and do like three gigs a day and stuff. Cool. God, that's a lot. And uh, I forgot what I was going to ask. See, when you're doing in the frequency and like the volume of work that you're doing for like comedy, do you find that you talk about like doing two or three gigs in a day? Do you find that sometimes that's beneficial to your like writing process and like honing the works, or do you sometimes feel like you need a bit more time in between to allow in the thoughts to kind of percolate? I love doing more than one gig in a day. Really? <clears throat> I love it. Like, uh, I did it for the first time after lockdown. Um, Monkey Barrel used to do, <clears throat> if you're booked on, they started with their weekend shows, but then they started doing it with the, the Wednesday shows as well, which are the, the ones that I do. And um, <clears throat> they used to do, you would just get booked for two shows. There'd be an early show and a late show. And you would just do the exact same lineup twice. I think there'd be one extra person in the later lineup because it was like a slightly longer show. Um, and that was the first time I did it because the first time I went up and I did like all right and it was it was a good gig. But the second time I did it, I was like, oh, I'm just sort of doing my same set again, but like with like a little bit changed because I know what worked in the first set. That was also one of my first gigs back since lockdown, so maybe I shouldn't have done that. But um, I went up and I did it, and I was like, that second gig, I was like, oh, I was like so sharp. Like it's like having a dress rehearsal that's also just a good gig. Yeah. I don't. I don't want to treat an audience like a dress rehearsal. Like I want to entertain them the best I absolutely can. But mm. it's like, oh, I'm just like so sharp from doing this. And then that year at the fringe, or last year at the fringe, I did like four gigs in a day one day. And that, that last gig, I was like, I, I'm like just the sharpest I've ever been. Were you nervous going from? Because I know a lot of people talk about first gig stories or bombing stories. Were you nervous transitioning from open mics to a paid gig? Uh, yeah, kinda. To be honest, I don't do enough of them. So right. like I still kinda get nervous. I'm starting to get like more than I ever have now. Um unless you're from HRMRC, then I do <laughs> no paper. <laughs> <laughs> um but <laughs> uh yeah, no, so I was like starting to get like some more of them now. But I think I've just done so many gigs, and they're usually for people that I've gigged for before for free that I'm just doing the same mm-hmm. stuff that worked anyway so i just try and treat it the same i think it's also because like because i'm gigging more now as well um so like for example like uh when was it like big beginning of march there was two weeks where i gigged seven gigs in seven days um with like there's like a couple of days in between and uh I was also working like 42 hours that week as well at work. Mm. So I was so tired that I was like, I think I did like four paid gigs, like one of those weeks. And I was sort of like, this is all the same to me. Mm. <laughs> I'm so tired. I can't concentrate. I don't have time to be nervous. Mm-hmm. Um, like I did, a, I was on with, um, I was on with Rich Hall, like during the Glasgow Colony Fest. The American guy. Yeah. 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 Like I'd watched him on TV for years and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And like I had to shake his hand backstage and I was just sort of like, just a guy yeah <laughs> um yeah that was weird it's just like things like that i'm just like there's so i'm numb to it now like yeah not not in a bad way not in like i don't care i'm just sort of like oh i should just treat it like i'm like i'm at work again you know i'm at work but i get to be silly for 10 minutes mm-hmm. you know yeah i'm uh, no, sorry i've I, I took an inhale of breath there and yeah, like, everyone's expecting a question I was just the of... question <laughs> the, the strewing inhale um 
Sorry. We'll get the pictures out, yeah, just hang yeah. over an hour. Okay. So we did uh, meet up with you in the lovely Roselle Park. In terms of feedback, can you talk us through uh, <laughs> our intro and meet style? What? Sorry? <laughs> How did you find the experience of uh, getting photos taken? And oh, it was good fun. Like, I just got to go to a park that I've been going to for, like, my whole life um, and just stand about and... And pull faces. From yeah, pretty time. much. It's what I do in the mirror every day. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'll pass this over to Daryl because we've got Daryl's set it first. Um, it's a bit of a strange photo to start on, uh, just out of the... Oh, cool, yeah. Just what? breaking the ice. Am I pressing up, down, right, or this way? Down. Down. And if down doesn't work, go right. Okay. <laughs> Just press all the buttons. Uh, right. There you go. So this is the classic peak out shot. Can you see it okay? Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, just going for a kind of bright, quirky yeah, feel yeah. to the set. Those eyes are really intense. I got, I got the crazy eyes. Yeah. 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 And I think regular viewers of this podcast, if we have any of those, will uh, <laughs> recognise the style of work from the Chris Barden podcast. The and if you haven't seen that podcast, you can find that in episode two. <laughs> I think I did watch that one, but I just didn't watch all of it. It was That's, that's going to be the long. DBTM aesthetic for photos. <laughs> um, so there's a couple of photos here which just a kind of more normal headshot. This one was you're facing the camera after. Just kind of nice, like blurred background. Uh, your shirt was popping against the greens. My shirt was popping, baby. Popping. Popping to my mum that she bought me the shirt. Shouts. Yeah. Your mum yeah. will like that one. Nice smile as well. <laughs> <laughs> and then we get to this one. <laughs> Emerging like a like a a, a, a fairy from 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 floor. <laughs> <laughs> Um, am I at the end already? No. Is this not okay? Okay. But what? It's all sorted. And this what is, am I doing uh, here, man? It looks you were like up I'm... a tree trying to be Indiana Jones, and you were singing <laughs> about fighting Nazis. <laughs> <laughs> did, I, did I hit my head? Did I fall out the tree? I don't remember any of this. I think you had adrenaline because you were about to climb the tree. Or you oh yeah, that's true. Up, but... I think your girlfriend did talk you out of that one. Yeah, as well. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just the the trainers had to get in shot with. Yeah, go get the get the badge in. Um, this is my Power Rangers shoes. This is a very, there's something it's a quite nice one. and innocent and childlike about this. Yeah. And it's not, it's not necessarily just because you're playing with a toy. Yeah, I brought an action shoes. figure. I, my, I was like, I don't just, know, should I do props? <laughs> uh, so I brought my, one of my Power Rangers. It's just, it's nice and airy and light with the flowers. Um, and then I think it moves on to the start of, uh, what's that film? It's not like... Midsummer. Midsummer, And I'm sure it's like a DVD cover as well or something like that. Oh, uh, Eternal Sunshine? Yeah, that's the one. Um, so you got your kind of dazed one, and then a you go, very you not dazed crazy one. Eyes back in, yeah. <laughs> Starting, I'm building a brand here. And then... Uh, passed away. In memoriam, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then we have the, the triple. <laughs> <laughs> so this is uh, Craig Wilson and... Uh, what was his name? Troy Flex? Oh, Duke Flex. Duke Flex, that was it. And then, so one of the photos we took. Oh, I quite like that one. It's Hold whistling down. a little tune, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Steamboat Willie in it. So this one and the other one you saw when you're peeking through the leaves, I had an idea in my head and I didn't know why. And it wasn't until I got home that I realized it was, I think it was the cover of a Rob Schneider film, The Animal. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so I've... Uh, <laughs> oh, is the Rob Schneider one not on it? No. Okay, we'll cut. We'll cut to the actual Rob Schneider video cover and do a side by side. So I just made a wee. I just basically copied the DVD cover, but that's that's you if you ever. I'm really glad that it's called the animal and not the beast. That would be, <laughs> <laughs> be terrible. Are you going on your uh, your photos? Yep. So I've got a few, not quite as many as DB had, but. Uh... And, well, I was shooting some behind the scenes and I kind of got caught up a little bit in that, so I don't have as many to show you, but okay. I, I favour. But the documentary will be yeah. immaculate. There was some nice behind the scenes, so I kind of, I, I, I straight up copied Daryl on this one. <laughs> <laughs> and then I photoshopped some more flowers into it. Oh, did you? Yeah. <laughs> I like I like the way I've got because like for behind the scenes people I was like holding those branches to go, <laughs> yeah. to my face. but like the way that it's edited now it looks like I've like summoned them. 
<laughs> yeah, Come to me. I added a few children. more flowers and a few more leaves in just to to bridge some of those gaps. That was first thing this morning because I was like a child handing my homework in late. <laughs> on it Put it on the train. <laughs> That's very cool. Then, so I th- I didn't realize you hadn't put your perspective one in, which you asked him to send to the tree thing. The what one? Oh, when I when I got him to lean against the tree, yeah, yeah I, I took that out. I didn't like the light. So then I nicked Daryl's idea of doing a double exposure <laughs> and just mashed you into this one as well. I like it. It's like the the two um, the two parts of my personality. That's exactly what I was going the for. Guy, Thank uh, you for saying that. The guy, <laughs> the guy with the cool shoes and the guy taking a shit. <laughs> <laughs> and then I think this next one um, is you and your pal. Oh yeah, yeah. Me and uh, dead eyes, <laughs> nightmare, no eyes, Shrek. <laughs> Gabe Featherstone will like that one. Yeah. And then we asked you just to take some some flowers, specifically yeah. Red Campion. You asked him, not me. I, so, I always say we as a collective. Oh, sorry, <laughs> the royal. We, we. and the royal. <laughs> <laughs> And yeah, and then we had a little bit of debate over which year it ought to go behind and what that may or may not signify to the other dog <laughs> walkers <laughs> in the park. Yeah, well, yeah, because we were talking about um, what, what, how did we even bring it up? Like, well, you had, you said you both had a similar idea for a oh yeah for a joke yeah because yeah. like because we I, I I used to get bullied for quote unquote being gay when I was younger like and I don't know if that meant like actually being gay or just like would because kids are horrible and they say it as like a, an <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't mean gay back in the day it just meant no it just meant loser or, yeah, or something. Yeah, yeah. which is which is totally better um <laughs> but uh we were talking about like kids would ask you there's a great uh actually comedian uh mackie leaper uh he's got like a comedy central set where he does this joke but uh he talks about like kids go to you uh oh, have you got pierced ears and, and they're like no well see if you got your ears pierced what ear would you get pierced? And then you'd be like, I don't know, the left one. And they'd be like, that's the gay ear. <laughs> and we were just like, oh, what's the gay ear to put some flowers behind? <laughs> Apparently, Listeners, it's the right one. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently the same goes for different coloured hankies and pockets. Yeah, I found that out from, a, I think it was like a Lil Nas X music video. Oh, right. Uh, mine came from Ricky Gervais in an XFM podcast. Oh, there, there you go. But uh, for people who want a wee challenge, they can go and see what Bruce Springsteen had in his pocket in the Born to Run album. That was. I mean, cool. I, think, I think I think the translation from that one was he was uh, had an arm an armpit fetish. Oh, cool! <laughs> Based on <laughs> what is the flower? <laughs> what is the flower Sorry, in my, my right ear say about me then? And if it's and if it's bad, I, we can just flip the photo. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea, but but we didn't get challenged by any dog walkers, so I that's think we're, fine. We're, we're okay. No, no doggers asked me to join in. That's fine. And that was my that's my set. <laughs> Good shit. <boys. laughs> oh, yeah. For your information, we say this to most guests. So, Strun and I were doing photography for like six or seven years. We started a company. John's a media that does promotional content, but portraits, taking photos of people is not something we're experienced in. So we thought this podcast would be a good idea to like sharpen our skills, as you would say, and get to know interesting people, talk about their creative processes. Um, but yeah, I'd say thank you very much for coming on. I thought it was dead interesting. And all the Game Boy chat especially is uh, kind of want to try it myself. But um, <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Well, it's been it's been really interesting to hear about your writings down and how you're you put your stuff together when you're performing and even doing so many shows in a day. Uh, I don't recommend it. To hear how that... <laughs> I just like it. Doesn't necessarily translate to how we operate, but um, yeah, it's, it's interesting to get that perspective on it. So with the posting time being early July, mm-hmm. do you have anything you want to plug or your friend show? Or yes, that's it? perfect timing for my friend show. <laughs> um, come and see me. I'll do it on this camera. This, yep. this camera, this camera, this camera, <laughs> hot ones. What have you got? Um, uh, I so I'm doing a fringe show. It's called Craig Wilson Comedy Ninja. It does have work in the progress in the title in case it's bad. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, it's going to be at uh, it's the venue's called Just the Wee One at uh, Just the Tonic at the Caves. Uh, it is on from uh, the third the third of August to the thirteenth of August. Um, and it is um, at 
ten fifty. Uh, all of those nights, ten ten to eleven. Don't know why I said it the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> it's a work in progress. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Case is bad. Nice. Well, thank you very much. Should we get now? We uh, come get a Jezebel. <laughs> <laughs> Jim Ross to end it. Can I do a final gym to the camera? <laughs> <laughs> no better way to end it. Perfect. Cheers. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs> <Cheers>. <laughs>